First of all, I'd like to thank our panel for being with us this afternoon to talk a little bit about fashion media. So I'm going to get started. I just want to um, ask each of you a question. I'll have you guys um, take it in turns, but also feel free to kind of interact and jump in and have a conversation with each other. So tell us a little bit about how you first became interested in fashion and fashion journalism and what role models you looked up to at the beginning of your career. Why is your mic in your lap, Terry? You go first. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I, I, I love coming to FIT. I'm happy to be here again and uh, talk to all the students and everything. Uh, so the question was, you wanted to know about how we got inspired? Yes, and who, who are your um, kind of early role models in fashion media? <clears throat> OK, well, I actually, uh, and you probably read this in some of my bios, I, uh, went at 14 years old, my uh, junior high school newspaper um, teacher decided that uh, I should do a fashion column. So this is 1968, and I did a column called Terry's Tips for Fashion Flair. I was, um, <laughs> and so I actually, it's funny, that's what got me interested in journalism. The teacher knew that I liked clothes, and she decided that this would be a, a, something fun for me to do as part of the uh, junior high school newspaper. And so I wrote a column, I think eight columns, and they were, you know, full of, things that I, I was subscribed to Vogue. It, this sounds very familiar. Everybody who's interested in fashion, we all subscribe to Vogue and, and Harper's Bazaar and all the fashion magazines. And so that got me interested in journalism. And then, but I did not plan to actually end up doing fashion. I ended up doing a lot of other things. And then in 1989 um, at the Wall Street Journal, after I was there for several years, the um, managing editor decided that we should start covering fashion as a business. And so that's how I started on it. But in terms of, but I really didn't have any kind of role models because at that time, the newspaper did not cover fashion. I mean, they covered stories every once in a while, but they didn't start covering the industry. I mean, I had to figure out how to make this, engage our readers. And Wall Street Journal, as you all know, is the, is the leading business publication in the United States. At that time, it was a two-section newspaper. We had no color pictures. It was mainly dot drawings and charts and everything else. So I had to come up with ways to uh, engage readers, writing about public companies and then doing other stories about designers and just different trends in the industry. And so, so that's how I, you know, so I had to kind of figure this out on my own. Constance? Uh, I got started, I didn't really have an ambition to go into fashion and I was really gunning to, to be a journalist in music. And so when I graduated, I went to, to a career fair. And at the career fair, I saw this um, gentleman with all these publications in front of him. And one of them, and if any of you have ever been to a career fair, it, it's like hard work and could be very boring, right? So I'm walking around, I see this man, and the, one of the publications on his table caught my eye. And it caught my eye because it was a publication that my husband used to get at home. It was like, oh. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna strike up a conversation with this guy. So you know, we're talking and we started talking about this finance mortgage publication. And he said, you know, so, you know, but why are you here? You know, wh what are you interested in? And so on, I said, I'm interested in music. And he said, well, we don't publish some, anything that covers the topic of music, but we do publish a publication called Women's Wear Daily. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> so I was kind of, yeah, I've heard of it. Um, I said, but anyway. Um, <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to apply to, you don't publish Billboard. And so I had figured that, because I was a young mother at the time, that I would have to actually leave New York to, because in journalism, you really want to start out outside of New York, which is the center and sort of the zenith of journalism. So I was a young mother, and that didn't work for me to leave New York. So I figured I started a trade publication. So I thought, OK, I'm going to apply to Billboard. And I did. And we were in the process. They were interested. I had an interview, gave them my resume, the whole bit. And then at the same time, these conversations were continuing with this gentleman. And I applied. He said, you know, you should really apply. And you know, so I did. And really, what happened was 
Women's Wear called me first and offered me a position in their training program, their minority training program, and, the, and I accepted. And the day after that, Billboard called me. <laughs> <laughs> and so to this day, you know, I say, wow, you know, forks in the road are very interesting sometimes, right, in our lives that I probably would have been going to Rihanna concerts. <laughs> 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 At a fashion show. <laughs> at 2 a.m. And I much prefer going to fashion shows at 2 p.m. <laughs> so um, one last aspect I'd like to comment on that. In, in the end, even though I continue you know, to this day to love music, the way that fashion has changed really has made it possible for me to somewhat indulge my love of music via fashion because it's become, fashion has become a part of entertainment in many ways since... Um, we've been in the business and also there's so much really incredible music at fashion shows um, that became very important in the last 20 years. Great. Dario, how about you? Um, I'm pretty new to um, the, I don't even know if I can call myself a journalist We're so much these journalist. women have like really created these careers. Um, but being like a photographer by trade and a visual director, um, what I was seeing were conversations that were not being had and being on the inside um, of so many brands and, and organizations, um, I, just, I just started linking things across cultures, um, across geography, and um, I just felt a need that no one was saying um, some some things that I wanted to address, and um, and I see for me um, fashion as an entry point to talk about other things. Um, so yeah, that's really my my intro to journalism. Um, yeah. So the next thing I want to ask you about is what unique perspective do you feel you personally bring to fashion journalism? And I want to go back to you, Dario, because you did say you did start in a more visual. Medium. So how do you think that maybe that has kind of given you a unique perspective when you think about writing, about text, or maybe something else that gives you a unique I, for perspective? For me, it's like, uh, it's all storytelling in a way. Um, so helping brands tell stories about their customer, um, their point of view. Um, but I think for me, what's unique is that I'm not writing as a career. So I'm not tied to any monetary gain. So I feel like I'm not tied to an advertiser or to make someone look great. Um, I just want to tell the truth and I want to be um, honest about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very equal in, in criticism and praise. And I find writing to be about justice. It's about it's about presenting your case, and it's something that I couldn't always do with images, and it's something that I couldn't always do um, with casting, um, but through, through the writing um, and being from a more visual standpoint, um, I felt that I could just offer something that was a little bit more unique, a little bit more even-based, and not necessarily tied to a paycheck, because I wasn't really writing to make money. I was really writing to get this idea out that I felt wasn't being talked about. Terry, how about you? Well, okay, I write about fashion in, in terms of business. And to me, and I always tell any young journalist, whatever, whatever beat you have, you are basically a business reporter. And Constance will certainly talk about that too because it, you know, women's wear daily, but we are all business reporters because everything revolves around money. I mean, if you stop and think about it, I mean, you, yesterday, the Super Bowl, I mean, everything you talk about, it's always, we want to find our audience, we want to fi figure out how much money was made, and everything, you're looking through the prism of business. And so that is the unique per perspective that I brought. And in 1989, when I started writing about the fashion industry, this was, we had fashion weeks, but they weren't the fashion weeks like we have now, where, you know, we have the, <clears throat> you know, everything is all under uh, the fashion calendar and everything is, is uh, organized. And, the business part was always something that was that I had to look, I, I wasn't writing about, I wasn't a fashion critic, I wasn't, didn't really care about what the clothes looked like. 
the clothes that were successful are the ones that made money because this is ultimately what this is, a business. And I, and I think that my perspective doing these business stories, finding the stories from public companies, from um, different uh, scandals that happened in the industry, um, and then just how things changed over the industry world, it made, I think it made, it store, made for a lot of stories that are a lot better. And I would also tell young reporters this too. A lot of reporters are saying, well, you know, gee, I don't know anybody and I don't, you can still do a great story without ever having to interview people. No, because remember this, and because you can actually research these stories, you can use Factiva, which is a, a, a search engine. This is not Wikipedia or Google, but this is a really good search engine that you actually have to pay to get into. It's like LexisNexis, but even more comprehensive and you can, look through the clips because there's no such thing as a news story. Every story has already been done before. And you can do, you can actually do and research these stories and get a lot of great insights and that you can also buttress that with things that are in court documents, also financial documents. All these public companies have to release their earnings and even though if it's a private company, if you know what's going on at the public companies, if you know what's going on in the news, for example, with um, uh, you know Neiman's Marcus and, and uh, Macy's is closing all these stores, we're seeing all the upheaval. All that is happening in the in the larger world. You can use that to extrapolate that to give you a, a sense of what's going on with small private companies. So I think that the business for any young journalist, anybody who's interested, and also I would tell you bloggers the same thing. You guys do some research. I mean, there's too much opinion just written. There's just a lot of people opining about this, that, and the other. Your stories are a lot richer and fuller if you can actually use, and you can use this documentation with using, using business. And, it's, and a lot of this is accessible. It takes a little bit of time to dig, but you can find it out. And uh, so I think, that's, I think that's been my big contribution because as people have seen me be successful and win CFD awards and write books and everything, a lot of this is not because I was, you know, palsy wowsy with designers, but because I was in there actually digging in and finding out the news. And especially nowadays, we're looking at with how important it is for the fourth estate to tell people the truth. Uh, you know, that this is something that, so, you know, I would advise everybody, follow the money and really basically pay attention to what's going on in business. Yeah. Thank you. So Constance, what unique perspective do you think you've brought okay. to your okay. career? Um, that's a really good question, interesting. I believe that, and I agree with, with what Terry says, and she's said it to me on many occasions, like follow the money. <laughs> and, and in doing so, what, what drives me though, and I believe perhaps what my unique perspective is, two things. One is I have a very keen sense of social justice, just period in my life, and I bring that to my fashion reporting, writing, um, what I do in fashion, how that expresses itself perhaps will be a story which talks about how come all the major or most of the major designers are still women, like all the time for decades. That just becomes to me an interesting question. And I'll express it in, oh, you know, I'm going to run a story of a model from the show. Um, why should it always be Kate Moss? Why can't it be Naomi Campbell? So those things which are important to me, and they may seem like small things, inform me. And then related to the last example is the other thing that I think makes my content providing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you know, my fellow journalists will appreciate that lame joke. But um, the other thing I think that makes it different is my Afrocentrism. And I think having an idea that I have a multicultural background and that we all do for the most part and bringing that to my work. I want to ask you all about um, a project or a piece of writing that you guys are particularly proud of, whether it has to do with social justice or your own perspective, but something that throughout your career um, that you can really point to and say, like, this is my work. 
Um, you know, interestingly enough, I'll start off what jumps out in my mind as a piece of work that I'm particularly proud of is actually um, something visual. So when I was at Essence Magazine, one of the things that was very important to me is making sure that the magazine reflected its roots and the very important place that it was and is in the world today. And part of that was doing, making sure that we had fashion shoots where women of all hues, the models were of all hues, the models um, were both, um, obviously all the models were black, but they were both light-skinned and European-looking, and they were dark-skinned and very African-looking. And in addition, the clothing also reflected um, Afrocentric influences. So when I think about some of that work, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And it's actually visual as opposed to written stories. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, one I'm most, I'm proud of a, a lot of big scope, scoops that I got. I mean, as a journalist, that's where we get, that's how we get graded, is writing, telling people something they don't know. And, you know, I've had big scoops, like when Mark Jacobs was in a big fight with LVMH uh, um, about this, he had been in the company for like about eight years. And I had found out, just I happened to be in London talking to a, uh, a couple of financiers who were telling me that they were going to start investing in Mark Jacobs, Jacobs' business. And I said, well, you can't do that. He works for LVMH. And they said, well, you know, he's really, he's getting ready to re, um, uh, renegotiate his contract. So when I came back to uh, the States, I called um, Robert Duffy, who was running Mark Jacobs at that time. And Mark just happened to be in the office. That week, he was not in Paris. And so I came over there just to schmooze. And we started talking, and then I found out that Mark was making less than a million dollars salary at LVMH. Oh, I after. remember that scoop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and was this scandal. story, that's, that, that's the story that I, I got the, the CFD award that year. And anyway, and Mark just started, <laughs> he started running his mouth. He gave me all this great information. And this story was a real, just a keyhole into seeing how Mark was negotiating with Mr. Bernard Arnault, who I also interviewed for this story. So it was, it was quite a big deal. So I enjoyed doing that because it's always giving people a sense of what's going on behind the scenes. The other story I did, this is also will uh, uh, appeal to you guys. I did a story about Ralph Lauren and race. And I don't know if you all remember this story. This was a story that no one talked, a lot of people knew about this story, but it was not a story that a lot of people talked about because Ralph Lauren's a big ag advertiser. Um, for a lot of publications. But in fact, a couple of magazine editors called me and said, we're really proud that you did the story because none of us could have touched it. And I, I don't think now that this story would have ever run anywhere. Um, but let me tell you what happened. And do look, do look this up if you ever saw it. Okay, now here's the here's reporters. This is a good thing for you guys to like see how I got this story. Okay, I used to cover the courthouse for the journal when Giuliani was uh, U.S. attorney. So I knew how to read a docket sheet. I knew how the courthouse worked. So the reporter who covers the, um, um, the courthouse brings over uh, a lawsuit to me that shows me about, it's a lawsuit, just a garden variety lawsuit, two employees who worked at Ralph Lauren who had, um, uh, were suing the company for discrimination. One of them was black and the other one was, I think, Latina. And they were salespeople and it was a kind of garden variety suit. It didn't look that interesting to me until I started flipping through the back. Okay, and that's where there was an addendum in the back. And the addendum had uh, on the letterhead of the EEOC that they were, had, there was some correspondence from the Equal Opportunity um, Employment Organization and that dated back two years. So it was clear to me that Ralph Lauren was under investigation with that. Okay, so that was very interesting. So I called some people over there who I knew and people said, yeah, they think there was something going on. And so little by little, I started to piece this story together. And I wrote a very explosive page one story in the Wall Street Journal that showed about that, uh, Ralph Lauren, the Ralph Organ Organization, had been under investigation 
for uh, discrimination, and there had been something like 17 cases that they had been looking at. And um, anyway, and in every case, the, they had basically just paid off, the employees had been paid off and they just left. And one of the, um, one of the lawsuits got through, and that's the one that was in that piece that I saw. So I wrote a very short, just business story, just very short story, and as soon as that was over, I called the, um, the um, attorney for, that, uh, for the plaintiff, because I wanted to get, and they, by then they had settled. As soon as we ran like a three inch story in the paper, they had settled. So that was close, so I couldn't get any information. So I had to try to piece this story together. And the story, it took me several months, and it was a, basically a story, and it wasn't a case of name calling or anything like this, but this was a case that there were a lot of salespeople the story starts out with um, eight employees who are working for a new store that Ralph Lauren opened in Roosevelt Field in Long Island. And uh, Jerry Lauren, Ralph Lauren's brother, came over to inspect the store before the store had opened. And the sales, the, the guy who was the manager of the store said, you people go in the back because Jerry's gonna be here today because the store looks too ethnic. Okay, so suddenly, <laughs> These guys showed up, and they, were, they, were, they had an attorney. The next thing you knew, they were getting ready to sue, to sue the company. And this had kept coming. And so how did all of them know to like look into this? How did all of them to, so anyway, the story is very complicated because I explained what happened. I ended up, Ralph and I had two or three extensive interviews. Um, uh, and you know, and it wasn't, you know, it was not, you know, acrimonious, because it was, it was a case of a lot of uh, underlings. In fact, he didn't even know about a lot of this that was going on. And a lot of underlings were, they thought that the company should look a certain way, that everybody at the company should look a certain way, and they had all kind of dress codes, and apparently they were, they were paying for uh, one woman to have her hair straightened and, and uh, blow dry. I mean, there were all these, there's all these little details that I had gotten in the story. And, and anyway, so they hired a guy from, who was um, uh, someone who helped, when, when, often when these cases come up, the Equal Opportunity Commission gives people a chance, companies a chance to try to like fix up, fix your situation, change the situation. So they had hired someone and they were doing sensitivity sessions at the, pay, at the company. And uh, you know, Ralph also, I mean they really, after the story came out, a lot of things changed there. In fact, they even had um, the, the chief financial officer who came from um, um, the Limited, a uh, black woman, was uh, the CFO there for a while. I feel like that this story had something to do with that when that happened, and, um, and it was fine. And the story was, and, and the, the thing about this story, it was a very subtle story, because it wasn't a story of people calling people names or anything, but just a lot of perception and uh, they just really didn't have a good HR department. And a good HR department would have avoided a lot of these problems. But instead of, instead of dealing with this when certain things happen, the company should have you know, actually dealt with it. And instead of dealing with it, they just paid these people off because they just wanted it to go away. And so anyway, um, that's a long story, but I, it's, a story that I, it's a story that I'm really proud of because I thought it was a difficult story to do. It was a nuanced story. And, um, and I actually won an award at Columbia University for this story. Absolutely. So, wow. so look it up, yeah. 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 So Dario, I have the same question for you, but before you answer, I just want to say that one of the kind of um, one of the talking points that Ariel and I have really um, been asked about in our exhibition is that quote, the one percent Vogue.com, and that of course is something that you wrote um, from a piece of journalism that you um, put out to the world. So I just want to ask you, kind of keeping that in mind, what's kind of what have you been most proud of? Um, that story, I, she's referring to a story I did for the Daily Beast, um, which was really right after Grace had won the LVMH award, mm -hmm. and there was all of this hoopla, and you know, kind of really looking at her like uh, an exotic bird, and uh, I was saying, well, it's, it's wonderful, but there was actually, there's a history behind that. There are a group of people who are here, and, um, and where are they, and who are they? And so that's what she's referring to. But for me, um, 
I think maybe one of the first pieces I did, which was for the Huffington Post, and it was um, right after a show I directed for um, the brand Pierre Moss, um, the designer's Kirby Jean Raymond, and um, the show was really to deal about, to deal with mental illness. That's what he was um, referring to, and so you know I found like sixteen black opera singers and like a five piece string orchestra and. We sang like uh, Future's Trap Niggas, you know, operatically wrote music, like the whole shebang. Um, but the show was called Double Bind, and it was really referring to research done by the psychologist um, Gregory Bateson in the 1950s, where he found out that many of his schizophrenic patients had very similar childhoods where they had received conflicting demands from one or both of their parents of repulsion and also affection. So um, the child, uh, the, the parent would reject the child, but then try to cover that with some kind of fake love, like, oh, but you know mommy loves you, like, you know, um, very kind of mommy dearest in a way. Um, and so as I was not only directing that show, but starting writing the piece, um, I was reflecting on this notion of these conflicting demands, and what happens is um, the child's communication skills break down, so they don't know how to receive messages. So either they take messages as having a hidden meaning, which is then paranoid, like paranoid schizophrenia, schizophrenia um, or they don't respond at all, which is a catatonic state, right? Catatonic schizophrenia. Um, or they laugh things off, like these messages, no, nothing has meaning. So things that are very serious, they just laugh and, and walk away, which is hebrephrenic schizophrenia. Um, and, and writing the piece, I realized, oh, this sounds like being black in America. <laughs> and so I wrote the piece really talking about how black people are walking around with the functional schizophrenia. Um, and we're not exactly sure how we're to receive these messages. Um, and, 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 it, and it's a sensitivity, and, and it sucks sometimes because you don't know what things mean. So, you know, how you interact with the person at Starbucks when they put the money on the counter and not in your hand, or when somebody walks out and they slam the door. You don't know what that is, but because you are a black American, you're, the messages that you've been receiving are mixed, and so you kind of walk around thinking, well, Maybe they're being racist to me, maybe they're not. And, and it's, a, it's a state of mind that is, um, that's, 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 um, that's tra traumatizing, but a lot of us walk around with it. And, and many of us, you know, some of us, we laugh it off and we act like none of it's happening and we're laughing or whatever. Some of us are completely stifled by it and we don't move. And some of us think that all of these things have hidden meanings and perhaps this person is being racist and, and we, we read into that. So, um, you know, and, and, and then I also spoke about, you know, um, I hate to say his name, the, um, the Donald Trump rally um, where you had uh, the black guy who was protesting and you had these people kicking him and hitting him, screaming, all lives matter. And for me, that was a perfect example of that. It was this hostility which was cloaked in simulated love, right? So they're literally saying, all lives matter, and they're kicking you at the same time. And that is what happens when you're a black American and you just don't know, you know, they, 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 they love black culture but they don't love black people. And so um, for me that was, I think, one that kind of crystallizes a lot of my background in psychology and then being a director and kind of weaving together these kind of seemingly disparate um, narratives. Thank you. Oh my God, this uh, panel went by so quickly. Uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Do we have time? One we question. do. We do have time for a couple of questions. But please, please um, help me thank our panelists. Uh, this is directed to Constance. Hi, Charles Klein. We haven't seen each other for a long time, and more than 20 years ago, I ran a panel discussion which you took part in with Jennifer Steinauer about your article at the New York Times about the death of fashion that wasn't particularly well received in the industry. And now with Macy's on the block, I'd just be curious to know what further thoughts you had about the article you wrote then and the state of the fashion industry today. 
Wow, that sounds like a whole panel. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so briefly, Charles, I would say that what Jennifer and I wrote about, <clears throat> excuse me, that was many years ago, um, is a continuum that we're seeing the end of, so to speak, today, um, as you said, with Macy's being on the block, because part of what we covered in that story, that was a two-part, he's referring to a two-part front page story that we did for the New York Times, <clears throat> excuse me, part of what we covered is how women were having a very different relationship with fashion than we had had before. And that has only continued where prior to this, women, there were so many different levers that we pulled and we, we brought to the fore in interviewing women and, and doing our own analysis that were true, which I won't get into now because we don't have the time, but what has happened today, I think we can all see some of that continuum and certainly we can all see what, what's in existence today, is that there is incredible opportunity as well as a lot of confusion around the fact that we have so many new ways of learning about fashion, which I think is incredible. Now fashion has become not only in the hands of a few people who are gatekeepers of information, but anybody, I would say someone can be in their kitchen in their bunny slippers now writing about fashion. And you're reaching, you're reaching a large audience. By the same token, the ways that we can actually sell or buy fashion, depending on what side of the counter you're on, has totally been exploded and changed also. The way we think about fashion as a cultural vessel, not just something that we wear, has changed. And therefore, and women are part of that, are driving part of it, and women are in, also in part the receptacles of that. Thank you. You're welcome. So unfortunately, we don't have time for um, any more questions. But again, thank you so much to our panelists for such a riveting conversation. Thank you.